All right, let's get started. Hi, everyone. Happy Tuesday. I'm Sarah, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Thank you for joining us for Extend the Power of Your Sage ERP. We're really excited about the content we have to share with you today. But before we dive in, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, this will be a 45-minute presentation with a live Q&A at the end. However, you can enter your questions at any time in the question box um, on the right side of your screen. And we will also be recording this event and we'll be sending a copy of the deck and the recording um, in a follow-up email. Probably you'll see it in your inbox tomorrow morning or afternoon. Um, so with that, let me introduce you to today's presenters. Um, on the line, we have Tom B. Miller. He is the founding employee and strategic alliance manager with Avalara, which is the leading provider of sales, tax, and compliance automation services in the cloud. Tom has been actively engaged for 30 years helping businesses solve problems through automated technological solutions. And at Avalara, he has assisted companies of all sizes identify problems that keep them out of compliance with current tax regulations so they can improve processes that help ensure full compliance. So thank you for being here, Tom. And then we also oh, thank you. <laughs> we also have Laura Lachen, um, and she is all tech sales director for the Northeast area. She has over 15 years of experience in workflow and content management and is adept at equipping organizations with state-of-the-art tools and knowledge to successfully streamline business processes and drive down costs. So thank you for joining us, Laura. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> and most of you know Kelly Pitt um, as your customer success manager here at BrainCell. She's also our executive vice president of ERP and was named a top woman influencer in ERP technology by Solutions Review. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for having me today. Thanks, All everyone, right. for joining. All right. And with that, Kelly, I will kick things over to you. Great. Thanks again. So, everyone, on the agenda today, we're just going to do a quick review about brain cell. Then we're going to jump right into Tom's presentation on how we can make tax compliance easier with Sage Sales Tax. Then we're going to hand it over to Laura. We're going to talk about going paperless and improving document management with DocLink. And then after, we're going to do that live Q&A that Sarah mentioned. So a little bit about BrainCell. This is our 25th year in business. Um, we still pride ourselves in being an unbiased business consultancy where we specialize in end-to-end -end business software and services, which include ERP, marketing automation, CRM, business intelligence, and much more. And one other thing, too, um, this note toward the bottom that says, we help you thrive by solving your business challenges with guidance and technology. I just want to make a quick note about that. This is something new that we have uh, implemented here at BrainCell, and this is our noble purpose. So this is a new philosophy that we've taken on here and are developing upon. And if anybody's read it, I'm just going to give a shout out because we have a webinar coming up uh, later this month with Lisa Earl McLeod, who wrote the book Selling with Noble Purpose. So we are really enjoying it, and it's it's already helped us, um, you know, envision a little bit more of an out of the box. Um, sort of theory when it comes to how we run our business. So if anybody hasn't read it, I highly recommend picking it up. Once again, it's called Selling with Noble Purpose by Lisa Earl McLeod. And without further ado, uh, Tom, if you are ready, we're ready. And uh, we're looking very much uh, forward to seeing what you can tell us about Avalara and Sage Sales Tax. Thanks, Kelly. It's um I'm excited to be here. I want to thank everybody for being on the line and giving us a couple of minutes of your time. It, um, we, we, uh, we, we reached out to the Wakefield group a little bit ago. Um, and they did a study for us and found out some very interesting, um, very interesting statistics. One of the things they found out was that almost half of the companies they talked to, 44 percent, couldn't remember the last time that they reviewed their sales tax policies. 
um, three quarters of those expected that an audit in audit they would uh, they'd be penalized and there'd be some fines to pay and the average small or mid-sized business incurs about sixty five thousand dollars during an audit so today um, we were going to talk about why sales tax compliance is difficult and complex and uh, sorry if you could help me out a little bit this doesn't seem to be advancing the slide at all uh, let's see here let me just I can only ad lib for so long. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're doing a great job, Tom. <laughs> you should be able to control. Give it a try now. Otherwise, I can do it for you. Nothing. Hmm. No, okay. it's not advancing. All right. So are you driving that or did I do that? I can drive for you. <laughs> All right. That sounds great then. And I'll let you know when we need to click through the next uh, the next slides okay. first thing I wanted to talk about with everybody was was really what's the risk in getting sales tax wrong and and sales tax really is there's two sides of the coin there's the sales tax that you charge your customers but as you know when you make a purchase you're also liable for the sales tax and if your vendor doesn't charge you the sales tax then that's where we get to the other side of the coin that's called use tax it's still a liability that you've incurred and there's really two risks in 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 use tax you can overpay the tax in areas where maybe your suppliers could have used your exemption certificate or if they undercharge you you can underpay those taxes um, and that's really the place that auditors seem to be focusing on now um, as they, they come out to, to, to look at, at, at the liability that you might have. Now, when you sell to your customers, you really have the same two risks. You can undercharge them, but you're still responsible to remit the correct amount, which decreases your net profit, or you can overcharge them, and in this case, you run the risk of creating negative customer satisfaction, and you still really need to remit to the states the full amount you've collected. So maybe you could click at this point, and let me just mention that there's a whole industry that's been built up to help out with reverse audits, and you know we think automation's a little bit cheaper for you. What makes it important is that states are relying on sales tax revenue uh, heavily. Many have been operating in the red for years now, and they're really getting more aggressive in writing nexus law, sales tax exemptions, and auditing procedures, and the pie is huge. 47% of all state revenue comes from sales and use tax. That's a big number. Last year alone, there was over $23 billion in uncollected sales and use tax across all the states. Now in California, the number was over $4 billion. And in New York alone, the number was almost $2 billion. So it's a big piece of business. It's not enough for them to balance the books, but certainly it does take them a step forward, and they don't want to miss any of it. So if we could advance, that would be great. Um, I guess when, when most people tend to think about sales tax compliance, they focus on getting the rate correct, and, and that's really what they're looking at. But, but rates really are just the tip of the iceberg. We're going to spend a couple minutes now and speak about other issues that fall into to making sales tax so, so, so complex. We're going to talk a little bit about product taxability, uh, preparation and filing, and some audit re uh, readiness. But the first place that we'll want to start is on the Nexus challenge, which is on the next slide. And that's really the first question that you need to ask. The question really is, where do you have the obligation to collect tax in the first place? So Nexus is a concept that says, a state under their laws can declare that you have enough of a business presence in their state so that they can force you to become a tax collector for them. It's pretty straightforward, but each state has its own rules for establishing nexus, and those rules really go well beyond just physical presence. The states have been tightening the rules. That's a major trend to address the loss of tax revenues due to out-of-state sales. They're generally going to look at facility locations, sales and service people you have in the state, 
product, whether it's rented or leased, and act activities in the state like sales visits or trainings or trade shows. They're going to consider any inventory that's located in the states as well as affiliate sellers. See, many states argue now that companies who are able to generate revenue without any physical presence in the state still enjoy the benefits and protections offered by that state to other businesses. Therefore, they should be required to support those benefits through the collection and remittance of sales tax. And then in June, on the next slide, June of this past summer, this happened. The Supreme Court really changed everything. And if we could advance one more slide, this is probably the most significant change to sales taxes in the last 25 years. So let's take a look at what happened in South Dakota versus Wayfair. I'll try not to get real wonky on you, but about two years ago, the South Dakota lower, the judicial courts, the lower courts ruled that the state's economic nexus legislation was unconstitutional. But then about a half a year later, that would have been September or so of um, 2017, the state Supreme Court struck down that decision and said, it's it said it is constitutional. Now that was appealed. It went to the Supreme Court of the United States. They agreed to take up the case last January of 18 and they ruled in June last summer. The ruling was in favor of the state. So basically, SCOTUS, really all they did was they flipped the decision back to the state courts. And by doing that, since the South Dakota Supreme Court had already determined that economic nexus was acceptable, SCOTUS effectively overturned the longstanding physical presence rule from 1992 in the case Quill versus North Dakota. That basically said you have to have an employee or a location in state before you had nexus. So the Supreme Court turned that down. Well, the question is, what does that mean? Well, what it means is now that South Dakota and, in fact, all of the states have the authority to impose sales tax obligations on out-of-state transactions using economic nexus as the basis. Okay, next slide. And historically, the states have come up with all sorts of different rules to trigger nexus. You'll recall that there was an affiliate nexus for a while. There was click-through nexus. Some states even have a cookie nexus. And economic nexus is just a new way for states to impose the tax collection obligation on you, the seller. It's based on revenue and your sales activity in the state. So the concept argues that by selling some defined dollar generating some number of revenue or by producing some specific number of sales over a given period in the state, you've created nexus. So let me give you an example. Uh, Nebraska legislature recently introduced a bill that required sellers with sales of greater than $25,000. It's not a lot of revenue or only 200 transactions to begin collecting sales tax. They left a loophole in it that said if the seller refused to collect the tax, it was okay, but the seller needed to, no to notify the Nebraska purchasers that tax is probably due. They needed to send the notification to buyers by January 31st of this year showing the total amount that was paid by the buyer, and they needed to file a statement by March 1st with the state's Department of Revenue saying who bought and how much. Unlike physical presence, this is based entirely on sales revenue, transaction volume, or both. And there's probably about 33 or 34 states, plus the District of Columbia, who currently have these various rules on the books. As you'd expect, economic nexus criteria vary by state, so there's nothing consistent from state to state. Some are going to look at sales last year. Some will look at sales in the previous four quarters, and some are going to look at sales over the last rolling 12 months. And the revenue threshold also varies. So some won 100,000, some do 200,000. So although this aims to level the playing field between non-collecting out-of-state sellers and in-state brick-and-mortar businesses, it really becomes another layer of complexity to deal with. And on the next slide, you'll see that South Dakota was the first to get permission from the court 
but many other states have followed their lead with similar economic nexus rules. So here's a visual overview of the states that have adopted the various nexus laws as of April 8th of this year. So the states in blue are the ones who have economic nexus laws on the books. You can see here that Vermont, Kentucky, and Hawaii, they passed laws that took effect in 10 days well, July 1st, less than 10 days after the ruling was made. Four states came on board at the beginning of January this year, and we expect most, if not all, are going to pass legislation this year that allows them to impose that collection obligation. Um, California began collecting in April. Vermont and Pennsylvania in July. Texas is coming on in October. New York hasn't set a date. They said sometime this year we'll set a date and let you know. So th there's a lot going on. You can view this map. We keep it updated daily at avalera.com. And if you go into our website and choose the resources section, then just click on South Dakota versus Wayfair. And you'll see this map as well as a ton more information to help you out with your research. So you're probably wondering what should you do? Well, we rec it, it's clear that you're going to need to understand the changing tax obligations. You'll want to reassess your nexus footprint and get registered where necessary. So if you have a trusted uh, state and local tax CPA or an attorney or tax advisor to counsel you, that's a great starting point. If you don't, you know, we have a directory of experts that you can contact, and we also offer these services ourselves. So there's a lot of places that you can go get some help. But let's jump back into the key challenges. Um, Nexus really isn't the only concern. So understanding which tax jurisdictions a specific address belongs in can be a significant challenge. Today, there's over 150 million addresses. They each fall into one of or or more, you know, they each fall into different jurisdictions. There can be multiple jurisdictions over an address, and there's 16,000 taxing jurisdictions in our country with tens of thousands of rates and thousands of changes annually. Sarah, if you can click once, let's um, let's take a look where you can see the tax jurisdictions tend to overlap. So here's an example from parts of three counties around Denver showing just six zip codes. If you click now, you'll be able to see how those different jurisdictions are geographically positioned in different parts of the zip codes with various rates. And once more, in just one zip code, you can see six different jurisdictions with nine tax rates that need to be applied. What's important here, you can click once more, is that many companies try to use zip codes to identify the taxing jurisdiction and thus the rate that needs to be taxed uh, on any on any transaction. You can see from this uh, this map that zip codes are just going to be inaccurate. They're not going to they're not going to help you out that much. You really need to pinpoint the address to find the correct jurisdictions. So we figured out where you have Nexus and we've defined all the jurisdictions your customers are in. But different product categories fall under different rules. And there's over 1,800 different rules, almost impossible to keep track of them. Those laws, the taxability laws, are regularly changing. And it's essential for the seller to know what's taxable in each jurisdiction to prevent exposure and liability under audit. Product Taxability laws, like all things sales tax, are also not consistent across state lines. So what can be taxable in one state can be exempt in the next state over. And you need to know what's not taxable in order to avoid overcharging your customers. So we always recommend a taxability review on your products and services, particularly if you've added new ones recently. Now here's just some examples of similar products being taxed differently. and for the life of me, can anybody tell me why Nestle's Crunch are taxable in Indiana, but Kit Kat and Twix candy bars are not taxable? It's a goofy rule, but Kit Kat and Twix contain flour. Indiana 
maintains that since it has flour, it's food, so it's not taxable, but Nestle's Crunch has no flour, so that becomes taxable candy. So the industry, it, and, and every industry has these weird kinds of rules, but some of the more difficult ones, if you're selling hardware or software or digital goods, any kinds of services or medical devices or equipment, food and beverage, clothing, school products or dietary supplements. I mean, these are just a few of the industries that are real complex and have many, many rules that are regularly changing across state lines and, and difficult to keep up with. Then on top of that, on the next slide, some of your customers are going to come back and tell you that they're tax exempt. Um, this is a problem because now you need to collect the tax exempt certificate in order to not charge them tax. And when we're talking about this, it's not about, you know, it's not about getting the tax right anymore. Now it's about being able to prove why you didn't collect the tax from them in the first place. And this is a challenge because employees typically are going to find it pretty difficult to collect them. I know as a career sales rep, you know, the happiest days of my career when I'm able to bring back a big contract to the company all signed and ready to go. And in the most unhappy day is the next day when somebody from accounting shows up at my desk and says, we can't book this deal because they're saying they're tax exempt and you didn't get the certificate. So now I need to run back out to the customer. I need to find whoever it is in accounts payable that can get me a copy of the certificate. And then nobody ever told me how to validate them and make sure that it was real. So as I go through a lot of my clients' uh, exemption certificate folders or files, it's amazing what gets put in there. I, in one case, I found a copy of a driver's license that somebody accepted as a tax-exempt certificate. These things only add stickiness to the sales process. Process The retrieval is time-consuming, it's hard, and a single missed certificate can cost you much more than the taxes that you didn't collect. We can help you out with that, and that only takes a conversation with the folks at BrainCell. So moving forward, you understood where your nexus is. You've located all their jurisdictions and rates. You've identified all the product taxability rules. You've marked all your customers' tax exempt that are. You've figured out the tax. Now you can look forward to sitting down to do the tax returns generally monthly, sometimes quarterly, depending on the state. And to do this right, you're going to deal with a filing calendar because you're going to need to know which states take e-file, what their payment processes are, what their deadlines are, if there's any local filing in the, in the home rule states. You're going to have to aggregate information across all your systems. So you've got an ERP, you probably have a couple of different websites, maybe you have a point of sale system. All these different systems have sales sales information that needs to be aggregated, put on the sales tax return, sent out to the state on time, accurate, with payment, and you know they're going to have questions that you're going to have to reply to on time or there's going to be further penalties. You're spending too much time on prep and filing, and it's taking time away from your higher-valued projects projects. It, it, this is not a revenue generating activity. It doesn't improve your sales competitiveness, and it just takes time away from other strategic uh, properties, other strategic um, projects. I'm sorry, but there's a better way. A little bit about Avalara, this will tell you what to look for in an automated system. We sit in the cloud between the order entry module, your web store, your billing systems, and your government. And in less than a third of a second, all of your systems are going to have accurate tax calculations from hundreds of thousands of products across all 16,000 jurisdictions and take into account the tax status of your buyer and the product or service. All you really need to do is set it and forget it. And if you're using our CERT capture system, that's an exemption management service that manages, stores, and organizes the tax-exempt certificate in the cloud. The neat thing about this is even in your web store, you'll be able to put a little checkbox that the customer can click off and say, I'm tax-exempt. We'll immediately take them out to a wizard on your site. We'll ask about five or six or maybe eight questions, depending on what type of business they are and how they answer. 
will bring up the tax exempt certificate on their screen for them to review. They can sign it with a mouse and then it can be immediately available to your web store, your ERP, all of your systems without any further interaction from you. And then at month end, you're going to want a company that can prepare and submit the tax returns. Uh, we'll provide treasury services to ensure that those returns are submitted, paid accurately, and on time. This as opposed to some of the companies that are out there that are going to offer you a signature ready system where you really still need to produce the check recs, need to get them printed, stuff the envelopes, fill out the forms, track everything. It's, it's a mess. You're probably also going to want a company that can provide professional services or tax-based expertise deployed when and where you need it. Basically, with Avalara, you'll have a dog in the fight with you. So the question is really, why would you want to outsource your, your, your tax services? Well, the bottom line is that you're going to save time. Manual tax management is time-consuming. It's expensive you'll reduce your risk. I was surprised to learn last year that over three times as many businesses get audited annually for sales tax than the IRS audits for income tax. And you'll have a lot less aggravation. I mean, let's face it, nobody really wants to do that job. You know, most of the, the, the tax return accounts that I speak with They'll tell me right up front that, you know, they do that job because they want to get promoted into another position in their company or find another position in a different company. So basically, you're training people to do a job that is not their career goals. It's not where they want to be. They're going to go away and you're going to start all over again. So with that, let me uh, let me just mention that, that that manual sales tax management is time consuming. It's expensive. It doesn't make sense. It's like doing payroll in house. And even after you spend all that time and money, most companies believe that auditors are still going to find errors. So you're spending big money on compliance, but not really reducing your risk. It just doesn't make sense. It's a compulsory activity. It doesn't put 10 cents on your bottom line. It doesn't drive growth. It's mandated, so you have to do it. And you're already spending thousands of dollars annually just trying to stay compliant. What you want to do is what you do best, not waste your resources doing mandated tasks. And the folks at BrainCell would be happy to help you out with that. It all starts with a conversation. Just sit down with them, talk to them about your tax situation and we'd be happy to work with you and look forward to working with you. So with that, let me thank you for your time and then turn it back over to, I guess, Sarah. I guess Sarah gets it next, so thank you. Thank you, Tom, very much. That was excellent. And uh, for the time that we've allotted today, um, you really did a great job going into as much detail as you could, especially with regards to Nexus, because that is something that I still can't wrap my head around fully. So it's <laughs> awesome to know that we've got somebody as knowledgeable as you to be there to um, help us understand it. So yeah, thank you very much once again. Um, thank you. You're and kind. to Laura. <laughs> of course. Um, so, Laura, if you're ready, we are ready for you, and I'm um, looking forward to hearing what you're going to talk about and show us on the DocLink side um, as far as AP automation and document management. Well, thank you, Sarah, and uh, great presentation, Tom. I didn't know I learned so much about taxes today, so that's awesome. So you have, you know, uh, I'm there to help you with the tax service. Now, what about, you know, all the documents and information within your organization associated with all your sales, purchasing, and, and invoice, and, and so forth? So this is where DocLink come in play, okay? Because digital uh, transfer, transformation is happening, and we all need to be in the forefront of this wave here, okay? The surge of energy that is about helping company uh, manage your data, your document, and your process better. It's about taking the friction out of your internal process, resulting in you're know, able to streamline your traditional paper and manual uh, data entry intensive process, and paving the way for companies like yourself to achieve your strategic initiative. Now, in the world of document management, 
we tend to think about the documents and the uh, uh, and um, that precedes the process. But at the end of the day, it's about connecting the paper with the people, the process, and your data. Okay. So let's think about what is DocLink. Think of DocLink as your central repository where all your information is going to be stored. Many of you have multiple offices. You have locations throughout the world. You have people that telecommute and you know work at home because we want to take advantage of technology. We're able to, and that's why we can be anywhere around the world able to access the information when needed. So with DocLink is it allows you to store all your documents and information in one central repository. Instead of having data in multiple silos, you know, in your desktop or your network drive, you know, your office over in the UK versus over in Virginia and so forth, is to have it all in one place. Okay. But how do we get those data into the system? There are numerous uh, ways to capture your data. Now, unfortunately, if you have them in hard copy, you're going to have to scan them in. Uh, but luckily, we have OCR technology that we're able to read the data on your documents to help minimize a lot of your data entry. Okay. But you also process a lot of document in-house. Take an example, your purchase orders or your uh, sales orders and so forth that generated in-house. How can we easily able to get it you know, stored into your file cabinet? So we have a, fun a, a print function that will be able to allow us to capture those in-house generated documents and put them in your electronic file cabinet, DocLink. Also, is you're getting a lot of documents from the external source. People are emailing documents to you, your AP invoices, your orders, your purchase orders, your contract, and so on. So it's the ability to able to easily import those documents and store them into your electronic file cabinet. There's also barcode technology available as well and also the ability to import them directly from your email. So there's numerous methods of how to capture the data and store it into the system. Now, once it's in the system, some of the documents that you, Jerry, need to get to, uh, to your vendors and customers. Take an example purchase order that you create in-house, okay? It needs to get to your vendor. So yes, we have automated delivery tools, how we can automatically send that out to your vendors. Or your AR invoice, for example, okay? how you create them in-house, but when you send out that AR invoice to your customer, they want to see a copy of that signed delivery ticket with that AR invoice. So yes, we can streamline and automate that process as well. So there's no need for you to print or scan or copy. You just need to create that AR invoice and that's it. DocLink takes care of the rest. Now, there's also documents that are live working documents that need to be routed around for review and approval and action to take upon. Take an example, your AP invoice. They're coming in, it needs to be routed around. People need to review, coding needs to be done, okay? And then eventually once it's approved, you process the payment. So with the workflow, we can electronically route your documents around for review and approval. There's no more of you having to walk that documents around. Okay, giving you visibility to the documents from anywhere around the world, giving you the ability to approve and review off of those documents from anywhere with a simple click. And also full audit trail. Who approved off on that $10,000 invoice two years ago? But at the end of the day, once everything is approved, all is good, is that DocLink, we're going to push all that data over to your ERP. The nice thing about DocLink is that we are fully code integrated with your ERP software application. So that way you can, data is being passed back and forth between the two applications in real time to minimize that duplicate data entry. Because you have a lot of your vendor information and customer information within your ERP already. Why duplicate that data entry? Okay. Also, it's being that's fully integrated, you now have many ways of how you can access your documents. And one of the ways is that within your ERP, you're able to access and search for your documents directly within that ERP. However, you have a lot of staff that don't have access to the ERP, so they are going to search for the documents through DocLink, either through the web, DocLink web, through the DocLink client, or through the DocLink mobile app. So yes, they could be sitting at a conference, 
at the golf course somewhere and still be able to access the client files, the contract, the invoice, whatever documents that they are allowed to have access to. So DocLink can be used as a standalone system. Maybe you're running out of storage space. Maybe you want a system to be able to secure your data and have it searchable, okay? Uh, or maybe you, uh, for retention scheduling, uh, able to track uh, and the life cycle of your documents to know when a contract's going to expire or when the re retention period is up for that contract so that you can purge it and get rid of it from the system. Or it could simply be for disaster preparedness. Okay, we, all of us we live in a you know a, uh, a a disaster zone. I'm in California, so of course the fire. If you're in the Midwest, you have tornado. If you're in the East Coast, hurricane. Okay. Is to be proactive. Okay, take initiative. Have safeguard your data okay. because if all your data is in DocLink, in the server, doc uh, backup is being done. So if, if something ever happens to your data, we can restore that information. Okay. So let's talk about, oops, sorry, here's my apology. A little bit, oh, let me go back here. Um, so here's an example is AP automation. Okay. Most organizations, when they want to start to go paperless and, and streamline their process, they start with AP. Why? I hear it every day. We can't get the invoice approved on time because Sarah is always traveling on the road and she won't approve off on the invoice until she actually sees it. So we have to wait till she gets back to the office. By then, either we're late, we have to pay penalty fee, or that we can't pay, uh, take advantage of early pay discount, or that we're still waiting for the purchasing department to get the purchase order to us, or we're still waiting for the receiving uh, site to get us the receiving documents so we can do our matching. Uh, or that we're wasting too much time doing data entry. So that's why many organizations will start in the AP side of the house. Okay. So take an example, why AP? Here's a research done by our partners, okay, where take this example of your traditional paper process. These are costs, time. Are you spending every single day that you really don't realize? Do you realize that it costs a fifteen dollars, approximately fifteen dollars, to process a single invoice? But yet, if you were to go paperless and using the technology and workflow automation and streamline your process, your cost could be reduced down to about two dollars and eighty-seven cents. Big change, okay? Big significant uh, uh, ROI right there. What about the time? The time that it takes you to get your invoice approved and going through the process and coding and for the payment to be cut. The manual process of you having to track it down, where's that in the approval process? Tom, did you approve this invoice yet or not? Okay, taking 17 days where it can reduce down to about four days. I'm not gonna go through all of this. We can provide this to you, you know, for, for your research, your know, RI later on, but this is just like the real life research done of the savings going from a paper intensive process to electronic process. Okay, so we've been doing this for over 30 years. We live and breathe of AP automation. And we find that most company processes typically almost the same. Routing rules might be a little bit different, but at the end of the day, it's about a 12 step process. When an invoice comes in, somebody got to open it. If it's a purchase order invoice, you know, they have to match it or wait for the PO to come in and so forth. Then it gets routed for approval and so forth. I'm not going to go through all the process, but I believe this, this process looks familiar to you folks that are in part of the AP process. Okay. By going paperless and automation is that those processes do exist, but we can cut down some of those processes because taking advantage of the technology, okay, the technology is going to do all of that for you. Is that get your vendors to email the invoices to you. We have the ability to monitor your email server for Pacific email address. 
We're going to grab those invoices and we're going to bring it into the system. We're going to do the automated matching for you. The system's going to automatically route it to the appropriate people for approval. The system's going to track all the approval. For the non-TO invoice, okay, is yes, you still have to do the coding. I mean, if we could, we would do it for you. But like I said, that's the one step is you still have to do the coding. Approval gets done. And what we're going to do is we're going to push all that coding information from Docslink over to the ERP. You cut the check and then, you know, then process the payment. So going from a 12-step process, okay, narrowing it down to about three-step process. That's a lot of workload taking off of your staff every day. Okay. So of course, yes, we're integrated with SAGE and Intech as well. Okay, uh, so you can access all those documents within the ERP for, for yourself. So here's an example. We're going to, you're going to uh, invoice are coming in. You're going to review the invoice. Okay, we're then going to uh, route the invoice for approval. The invoice can be approved by email. It could be on the online through the web. Of course, we're going directly into DocLink. So we track the approval. We track who approved it and when any special notes. Okay. But once it's all been approved and coding, you can do coding and DocLink as well too. Okay. And once it's all done, we're going to push all that data over to your ERP so that you don't have to do that same duplicate data invoice, uh, data entry. Then, of course, is the process and you process the payment. We're going to capture an image of that payment we're going to store into the DocLink system. So that way, all the documents from your purchase order, from your receiving document, from the invoice, your uh, contract, um, and the payments, it's all in one system for search. Okay. So talking about the workflow approval. So yes, Tom, you can be at the golf course enjoying the game, but still be working. Why? Because with our workflow, we're going to notify you by email. And within that email, you can actually see the documents and you're going to be able to approve off on that invoice directly from your email and even add special notes to that email. I approve it only if you change the code, GL code to 12345, whatever that note is. Okay. And yes, our full audit trail will track the approval. Okay. By mobile app, you can approve too as well. Because let's say you don't have access to your email, do the mobile app you can approve. Okay. And of course, also online on the web. Okay. All you need is internet access from anywhere around the world. You get notified by email that you have invoices to approve. You log into the web. You go into your workflow inbox with a listing of all the documents waiting for your re re review, approval, or action. And of course, you can open it up, you can look at the invoice, and directly within DocLink, you do not need to have access to the ERP. You can even select the GL code from a dropdown list. Why? Because we are linked directly to your GL master file in real time. And yes, we can secure it down so that the approvers can only have access to certain GL code only. Okay. And yes, if there are certain Vendors that you purchase the same thing all the time, and you, if you have the GL code set as a default in your ERP, okay, we will pull that over as the default as well. The minute that you type in a vendor name, it's going to go into the ERP, pull over all the vendor information along with the default GL code. So now you just need to approve it. And then, of course, it's, once it's been approved, we're going to push all that coding information over to your ERP. This is an example of stage intact screen, okay? I apologize if the screen is a little bit small, but notice here within the example here, stage intact, there is a button that says view document. So yes, within the ERP, you're able to view all the documents associated with that particular transaction. This is the same thing for 100, 300, 500, you know, uh, the ERP that you're using. And then, of course, is once you process the payment, we have a feature called ERM, Enterprise Report Management, where we have the ability to capture an image of that payment, along with all the data about that payment, and we're going to store it to the docking system. We're going to link this one payment 
to all the associated invoice people. So that way later on, Sarah, I sent you an invoice two months ago. What's going on? I haven't received payment yet. Sarah, who do not have access to the ERP and don't want to bother accounting, can go just go directly into Docklink, type in the invoice number. If it's been paid, Sarah will see a payment number and the payment date. If Sarah has security permission, she will see a copy of that payment. And if she has further permission, she can email me out a copy of that payment as proof. It's that simple, folks. It's a way of how you can improve customer service by having in instant access to the information. No more having to say, uh, wait, let me research or contact accounting and I will get back with you. This is the same technology can be used for sales order processing as well. As well. Imagine your customer calling in, Tom, I sent you an order two weeks ago. When are we, when are we going to get the order? Okay. By going into the system and know exactly where the documents are in the process, whose desk is it's on, be able to respond instantly. So let's say, you know, for if you want to go in and document to search, I can go in, type in an invoice number. Here's a system file invoice. But here it also is, I can also show me all the documents that's linked to this purchase order. So I can select them all. It will bring it up. I can select them all with a simple click. The system is going to bring up all the documents associated with that search criteria. So the idea is, folks, when you create a purchase order, Docwing, we are going to earn capture a copy of that purchase order, and we're going to store into the system right away. When you receive your goods and you're doing your receiving in your ERP, we encourage you to scan those receiving documents into the system right away, and those get linked to the purchase order. So that way, when AP, you receive the invoice, okay? The invoice comes in, okay? AP, you have everything right in front of you so you can do your automated matching right away. Or with our OCR technology, we can read your OCR invoice down to the quantity, description, the dollar amount, and we can do automated matching against your purchase order and against your receiving uh, within your ERP and within DocLink. Yes, we can monitor for duplicate invoices as well. Yes, we can monitor and see if that, um, that vendor exists in your ERP or not. Maybe it's a new vendor. And of course, is once you process the payment, then we store a copy of it into the system as well. So a complete history from beginning to end. So folks, that's just an example of one use of DocLink of how we can help you to go paperless and automation, okay? The key is, once you own the tool, you can use it for the routing and approval of any types of documents, okay? You can use this for the storage of any types of documents. You can use the workflow to route any types of documents around for approval. Maybe the processing of your orders, maybe uh, approval of expense report, approval of timesheet, approval of, you know, onboarding of a new staff. So an example of here, uh, live case testimony from a stage client before going paperless. It's a public company, international company, okay? So you can imagine the audits they have. And so one year they were audited and they were asked for all these documents and they were not able to find all these documents. They spent, you know, uh, weeks trying to search for all the documents, but they couldn't. So they were literally folks penalized $110,000. The CFO had to write a check for $110,000 because they didn't comply with the audit. So they were determined at that point that we'll never have to pay that kind of fee again. They went out looking at several document management solutions. Okay? They, 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 they ended up with a different solution, but it, and it turns out it didn't meet their requirements. So they're using the, uh, then they're using DocLink. So today, okay, their number of audit have reduced, okay, at the beginning, they actually went in, did a search, and downloaded all the documents to a thumb drive. I mean, DocLink will, you know, search the search result in literally seconds. And then they download the documents into a thumb drive and give it to the auditor. Today, because they, they understand the system, the power of the system, the security of the system, they actually now provide a login for the auditors, give them security permission to only certain types of documents. So now the auditor is doing their own searching in DocLink. 
Okay, their staff is no longer doing any kind of searching when it comes to audits. Huge return the investment right there. Another example, okay, supermarket chain in Puerto Rico. They are the largest supermarket chain. They start with dark lanes and AP automation. Okay, and understanding the power of the system, they actually expanded the system for HR. HR is the second most paper intensive department in most organizations. Because they understand that our security is very tight and very granular, it can help you comply with HIPAA requirements, secure their documents, and also help them comply with the onboarding process. Okay, They actually, uh, people who want to apply for a job actually goes into the website, fill out the job application online. Once it's completed, uh, our workflow notify HR, and they go through the hiring process. So no more paper. Okay, and their organization. And thank goodness, if you remember about, was it last year, the year before when they have that huge hurricane in Puerto Rico? Thank goodness for this company, they went paperless with Darkling. So all their data were back up in the server. So we were able to restore all their data. They had zero data loss in their HR department and in their um, AP department. Okay. One last example, uh, AAA. We all know AAA. They originally contacted Alltech because they, they, they'd seen us around and they needed a solution for AP automation because they have over 4,000 clients, you know, staff were, uh, uh, staff and they have multiple offices and their bottleneck, you know, is approval and getting timely approval and duplicate data entry and so forth. So they wanted AP automation. So luckily we went in and did a, a, a solution overview. And the CIO was in that meeting, the CFO, the controller, you know, pretty much the decision maker. They, they understand the power of Darkling at that moment, but by the time that we walked out of that meeting, they changed their initiative from just a AP automation to a full enterprise solution. Because then they implemented Darkling for AP along with HR, expense report, okay, and their contract management. Now today we're working on rolling it out to their claim department. So the idea is, if you have an accident, you submit a claim through the DocLink web, fill out the claim form, okay? And then the inspectors, the adjuster actually, will go out in the field. Using the DocLink mobile, they take a picture of the damaged automobile. It's, it gets uploaded through the DocLink mobile and gets attached to the claim. And then workflow will route it to you know, the, the, the next step, okay? So folks, those are just a few example news. So at the end of the day is knowing that DocLink is an enterprise content management system. You can start it in one area, but you can expand it company-wide, okay? Most customers will want to start in the AP, but I promise you is that once you start to go paperless, other department is going to see how efficient you are, how fast you're able to access your information, how secure your documents, and your force for disaster, and also disaster preparedness, that they are going to want to go paperless as well. So using the same DocLink system, you can then expand it to other departments from sales order processing, okay, to uh, expense report, corporate credit card pro um, processing, contract management is another big news, okay, um, and, and HR, the whole company wide, any department to have documents and information that needs to be stored, managed, and processed, we can help. So I just want to give you a few examples, and um, you know, so now it's up to you to take the initiative. If you want us to learn more about our solution, or uh, you know, um, how we can help your organization in different area within your business unit, um, you know, please reach out to BrainCell because uh, we all are here to help. And with that, I will go ahead and pass it over to Sarah for if there's any questions. Awesome. Laura, thank you so much. That was wonderful. And once again, with the time that we've tried to keep this webinar to, um, you, like Tom, did a great job presenting um, what you could in order to give us a good idea of um, DocLink and AP automation. Um, so thank you very much once again. Um, Sarah, I think we're going to open it up for questions at this time. Um, so folks, if you have questions, now is the time. We have a couple um, that have come through already. Um, Tom, um, on the Avalara side, 
Mm-hmm. Um, we have a question um, asking what types of companies will be impacted by the South Dakota Economic Nexus Law? That's a great question. Pretty much any company that sells across borders that does more than, let's say, $100,000 in revenue in any given state or 100 or 200 transactions per year in that state. Um, the economic nexus laws are pretty specific um, that, you know, if you're doing any kind of revenue or making any number of transactions, that's going to count. The other thing that 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 is impacted is you might do 200 sales across into into a specific state. Let's say 180 of them are tax exempt. That doesn't matter. You've still done 200 sales, and those states are going to want you to get registered and start collecting the tax on the other 20. So pretty much any company that's selling across the state lines are going to be impacted by this. It's a good question. Got it. All right. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Um, Laura, I've got one for you. Um, can you match purchase orders in DocLink to an invoice? Absolutely. So when an invoice comes in, if it has a purchase order number on it, uh, either our OCR technology will read the data. So obviously it's going to read the PO number. And it's actually going to look against DocLink and against the ERP to see if that purchase order number exists, okay? And also is that it can read the line item, the quantity, description, the dollar amount, and it can do automated matching against the purchase order and against the receivings if you do receivings. And of course, okay, if it doesn't great. match, maybe, yeah, maybe the quantity didn't match or the dollar amount didn't match or out of the threshold, it will put those invoices into an exception and alert you so you can take handling of those exceptions. Got it. All right. Awesome. I have another question for you, Laura. Um, so as far as the licensing is concerned, or actually it's a two-part question, um, part one is, does the licensing for the software have both named and concurrent licensing? Um, and then the other part of the question is, um, is this a web-based application and is it mobile friendly? So to the first question is the license are concurrent. They're shared. So you could have a okay. hundred, a thousand we don't, users, we don't care. It's only X number of people could be logging in at the same time, okay? And as for if this is a web-based application, absolutely. Um, you know, being that Intact is completely web-based. So yes, uh, it could be web-based, it could be on the client, uh, and definitely mobile-friendly. Uh, on the mobile app, you can search for documents, you can approve off on documents, you can also capture documents on the mobile as well. And also Great. on the web, right, thank you, you can also do GL coding on the web as well too. Got it. All right. Awesome. Hey, Tom, I've got another one for you. Um, mm-hmm. Somebody said, I think I may have triggered Nexus. Yikes. How soon should I begin collecting sales tax? <laughs> Yesterday. <laughs> if, if, you've triggered, <laughs> if you've triggered Nexus, the first thing you're going to need to do is register with the state, which can be done on the Department of Revenue website in most states. Some states, it's just a matter of sending paperwork back and forth. Many of the states are going to be pretty quick getting that paperwork done. Some of them, you know, the larger states, you might wait six or eight weeks for the clerk at the state level to get to your form. Um, and and if you if you triggered Nexus, you're going to want to start collecting tax right away. You're going to want to register right away, and then you're going to want to do a voluntary disclosure after you get your tax ID number you know, which could be two months from now, you'll want to do a voluntary right. disclosure on the two months worth of sales that you've been collecting on. So there's a couple of steps involved. Understood. We can help out with that. And most of the accounting firms that have assault or state and local tax practice, they should be able to help you out also. Excellent. Okay. Thank you for that, Tom. And mm-hmm. if folks want more information on the South Dakota versus Wayfair um, and some more background on economic nexus, where can they go to find that? Is it the Avalara website or is it somewhere yep. else? Yep. 
uh, while you can go to all 50 states one at a time and look at their Department of Revenue uh, information, or you can go to www.avalera.com, choose the resources section off the main menu, and then scroll down to South Dakota versus Wayfair link. And that map, as well as uh, all kinds of different information will be there, um, citations, state law, dates, things that we expect to happen and things that have already happened. There's a lot of information out there. Excellent. Well, very good. Thank you so much. Um, folks, I think that does it for us with the questions. Um, as Sarah said, and I'll just repeat, we will be sending out the recording of this webinar um, in just a little while and following up with everyone. Um, but on behalf of BrainCell um, and Sarah, myself, I want to thank you all so much for joining us today on this webinar. Um, Tom and Laura, thank you both very much for your excellent presentations. Um, look forward to doing more webinars with you both soon. And everyone, thank you once again. Um, we will be reaching out soon. Have a great rest of the day. Bye, thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Speak with you soon.